Hello, and welcome to Stocks Down Under. My name is Stuart Roberts, and I'm one of the co-founders of our service. And joining me today on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 29th of August, 2023, is Mr. Michael Thurn, who's the new CEO of Farmost, ASXPAA. Michael, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Stuart. Thanks for having me. In this globalized world, you can run uh, uh, pharma companies from anywhere. You're based near Orange in uh, central New South Wales. I am. I'm, I'm based in a small uh, outer suburb of, of Orange called Kangarooby, uh, okay. which is a very lovely part of, of the central west of New South Wales, surrounded by uh, um, vineyards, as a matter right. of fact. Right. You're lucky man. Well, uh, there'll be a few reasons to break open some of the local product in, in the near future. Uh, <laughs> Tarmos has been on the market for a while, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, its flagship product, Monopental, is now showing uh, signs of life as a potential therapy for ALS. Uh, tell us uh, how uh, a, a formerly an anti-helminthic drug turns out to be good in, in that most uh, tragic of uh, central nervous system disorders. So it's a great question. And uh, so as you mentioned, ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, is a, a form of motor neuron disease. And uh, research that's been conducted by Pharmos has been able to show that its mechanism of action, which is through mTOR inhibition, which is a kinase that plays a very important part in um, cell progression, uh, cell maturation, is uh, potentially a, has a, a role to play in, uh, in motor neuron disease. One aspect of, of mTOR inhibition is that it prevents the cell um, from going on and, uh, and and actually dying. And one of the one of the actual um, aspects of that is a process called autophagy. And autophagy is a is a term which is associated with a process of recycling cellular nutrients. And what we're uh, what the post yeah, the uh, opinion leaders are postulating is that what happens in these nerves that uh, are associated with uh, motor neuron disease is that there's a, an overproduction of cellular nutrients in the axons. And that overproduction of cellular uh, nutrients causes ultimately death of, that, death of that neuron. So if you've got a drug that potentially promotes uh, recycling of cellular nutrients, you're going to go a long way towards preventing the progression of ALS or motor neuron disease. So the chief function here is that uh, monopentanol or MPL, as we call it, uh, prevents um, or takes away, sorry, that inhibition around autophagy. So it promotes uh, the process of recycling cellular nutrients in the axon of that nerve cell. So we're, we're um, you know, very encouraged by that. Uh, obviously, the phase one study that's been uh, occurring, has been conducted here in Australia, both in Melbourne and, and Sydney, has produced some results that we've announced to the market. Uh, we've announced some interim results around various endpoints, surrogate endpoints that all show that one, the drug is, is getting into the blood at the required levels to, um, to release that mTOR inhibition to cause potentially autophagy, that recycling of cellular nutrients in the uh, the axon, in the nerve cells. So we're we're very encouraged by the by the results that we've been getting. Right. It's early days, obviously. Uh, and, and we'll need to translate that into um, into some endpoints that relate to uh, you know better patient outcomes. The good news is, uh, at least from a drug delivery perspective, is uh, because of uh, th there's really no treatment options for any of the motor neuro diseases. Um, uh, agencies could clear you at the end of phase two uh, into a, a potentially orphan drug market, which would be worth in, uh, billions of dollars. Exactly. So uh, rare diseases, um, diseases that that often get an orphan drug status with the FDA, for example, it has there's been a real renaissance in uh, in companies. Uh, going after rare disease drugs. And, and over the, the last five years, I think the, the statistics are that they're on in parallel with uh, drug 
drug approvals uh, with um, uh, all other drug approvals. So the FDA are approving uh, rare disease applications at the same rate as they approve normal drugs, which is it. which is interesting. Uh, well, like so, if you're going to get sick, get a rare disease, not a conventional yeah. disease, because you might get through it faster. Well, that's right, and, and and obviously that that translates into some of the big um, mergers and acquisitions that have been occurring recently. So as as recent as recent as June, uh, Novartis snapped up Chinook Therapeutics for for three point two billion dollars, and they had a range. Uh, they had a couple of late stage candidates for for rare kidney disorders, but. Um, you know, even bigger than that was, you know, the biggest deal that was done uh, in 2022 was uh, by Amgen, who picked up Horizon Therapeutics back in December for, for $27.8 billion. Uh, and that company, as in Horizon Therapeutics, had a number of uh, late stage rare disease opportunities. So for us, um, that you know, opens up a a, a, a massive um, a massive advantage as we move forward out of this phase one study into a, a phase two scenario. And as you pointed out earlier, uh, if we're able to get an orphan drug disease status, if we look at the drugs that were recently approved for motor neurone disease, uh, those data that they presented to the to the FDA to get that approval under the Orphan Drug uh, Disease Act was only phase two data. So the most recent uh, company that uh, had their drug approved for motor neurone disease or ALS was Amalex Pharmaceuticals. And uh, Amalex Pharmaceuticals went to the FDA with phase two data, data that um, you know contains similar endpoints to what we're capturing out of our phase one study. Uh, they went to the FDA. The FDA uh, allowed them to to uh, have an accelerated approval. That drug is out there in the in the marketplace, and that drug sells for uh, the list price uh, for an annual um, prescription of uh, of that drug, which is called Relivrio, is uh, over one hundred and sixty thousand US. So it's a you know for for drug companies. Um, big pharma, they see uh, rare diseases as a as a major opportunity for growth, particularly because you know over forty percent of these rare disease drugs, their list price are over a hundred thousand US a year. Right. So we we've got that ability, you know, quite soon to start talking to these big um, big pharma companies about our drug, about our results. Um, and you know potentially look at a partnership, but but more importantly, the the results that we're gathering out of this phase one study is going to be used to start discussions with the FDA. So as you know, the US, uh, sixty five percent of the market, uh, worldwide market for any uh, for any drug is really in the in the US, and we need to get in front of the FDA as soon as we can to one. Uh, obviously, look at what our next phase two study is going to be. Get their approval, uh, but also to uh, to sign off on a an orphan drug um, status for for monopentanil. Take it takes back in time when Pharmos was first uh, uh, taken public. Um, it had some IP developed by uh, Professor David Morris at the University of New South Wales around the use of monopantanil in um, uh, mainly blood cancers, I think. It's been tried out in canine cancers with, with for T-cell lymphoma with some success. Uh, uh, again, uh, this action on the uh, on the uh, mTOR pathway. Um, how do we then pivot from, from having monopantanil as a cancer drug to going into MND? Uh, it's all to do with the pathway. So uh, as I mentioned before, the mTOR pathway, uh, Inhibition of the mTOR pathway, you know, leads to to you know cell progression. Um, you know, autophagy is also linked into that. It's one way that that cancer cells are, are killed is by this autophagy um, uh, process. Right. So, so, who made the link? Is what I'm saying. 
that that, that uh, what what is useful in cancer could also be, also be useful in MND. It was more through the uh, interactions with key opinion leaders. Right. So, uh, as you know, the the uh, the phase one study for for motor neurone disease is through fight MND. Uh, right. So, fight MND is a a um, not non for profit organization that uh, is being looking at uh, you know potential drugs that may be useful in uh, in MND and uh, it was through through the link um, with those key opinion leaders that the you know the hypothesis around mTOR uh, inhibitors may be useful for for uh, motor neuron disease so that's um, you know, but, you know, essentially how that whole um, process of setting up the the M and D trial with fight M and D uh, through the grant application came about. Right. It's fair to say that uh, in the upcoming studies, if they work, Thymos uh, is going to be worth a lot more than the current market cap, which is uh, sub thirty million. And that's obviously attracted you to come and join this company. Tell us about your background. It has, yes. No, that was that was one of the things that. Um, I felt that you know I could potentially add to was to uh, uh, explain the science, um, bring on my regulatory background to help push this next phase through the FDA, and uh, that's where I really saw the opportunity. It was around um, creating awareness for the company and the uh, the science behind uh, the very foundation that has been built. By the company, uh, not only in the anti-cancer space, but obviously now in the um, you know central nervous system, the MND space. So to me, it was a, a great opportunity uh, to get out there, uh, talk about the company, educate uh, investors about what we're doing, and uh, about the near-term catalysts that the company uh, is capable of achieving. Right. Um- We've met uh, in a, a couple of uh, times previous to this. You were with a, a privately held company called Memedica. Uh, for a while, you were Chief Operating Officer at, uh, at at Botanix. Tell us about some of the other companies you've worked with before you arrived here. So, uh, yeah, before before that, um, I guess my regulatory path started with, uh, with working at the uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration. Uh, I was a, a senior... Uh, tox evaluator. So I, I got to evaluate all the big packages uh, that were coming in from, from various companies, various pharmaceutical companies for, for, um, for marketing here in Australia. So that was, that was a very good experience and gave me the confidence that, um, that, you know, I could become a, uh, an expert in drug development. So I've taken those skills that I've learned at the TGA. I moved into, into the private biotech space uh, with a company called Xenome. Uh, Xenome was developing a pain therapeutic uh, based on a, a natural product, a, uh, a toxin from the cone snail uh, um, from the, the Great Barrier Reef. From there, um, I went on to, to a company called uh, Cytopia. I was chief operating officer there. And I think uh, to this day that uh, I hold, you know, somewhat of a record of, of being able to to get an IND uh, for for a uh, an anti cancer drug called CYT nine nine seven. So I was able to put that drug through the FDA through the IND process within a six month period. Um, and came started. this close. Uh, we saw with Insight ultimately ending up with the billion dollar jack inhibitor market. Cytopia was a, was a was a pretty good effort to try and get into that billion dollar space. It was. It was. And uh, when I was there, I think at the time, um, it was the biggest deal that was done by a biotech company. So uh, it was a, um, a jack inhibitor. They signed a deal, um, a licensing and a development deal with uh, with Novartis uh, right. back in um, you know, uh, 2005. Uh, and then from there, I was uh, I was. Uh, encouraged to join a company called um, as founding MD uh, by the name of Spinifex Pharmaceuticals. And Spinifex Pharmaceuticals was developing uh, like Xenome, a pain drug. Uh, this one was an oral 
pain drug as opposed to, to something that was put into the intrathecal space like um, the Kona peptide uh, from Xeno. But uh, Spinifex, I um, was able to to uh, raise a bit of money for for Spinifex. Was able to get a a, um, a commercial ready grant. Uh, you know, basically built the foundation for the development of the uh, the drug for for pain for neuropathic pain. And um, I left, moved on to to Mimetica, But um, Spinifex was very successful. Uh, it was. Uh, acquired by Novartis for seven hundred odd odd million US. How does it feel to have been responsible for all that shareholder value? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I helped start it. I wasn't uh, I wasn't there to to uh, cash in on the check on the Novartis check, but um, yeah, I mean that I think it just underpins what what uh, I like doing, which is taking um, you know early stage companies and and pushing them through. Uh, primarily into that phase two space, and and as you're probably aware, a lot of deals uh, with big pharma or you know, even acquisitions uh, outside of licensing are done in that that phase two space. So, moving back to the attractiveness of of uh, being the CEO of, of Pharmos, uh, you know, this is the the time where you rapidly add value is from that phase two. Uh, to fa- sorry, phase one to phase two interface. So um, expecting big things uh, are far more. And, and obviously, um, as I mentioned before, there's some near-term catalysts. The final results from the phase one study is going to be one of those catalysts. But then having the interaction with the, the FDA, uh, clearing up a, an orphan drug disease status, but, but more importantly, getting signed off around a phase two study that could be potentially our registration study. Right. And uh, it's fair to say most of that can take place in 2024. And then we're, we're within spitting distance of, of that uh, that endpoint you were describing. Exactly. So uh, if I'm doing my job, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, we'll be able to start interacting with the FDA very, very quickly. A lot of the that interaction is going to be dependent upon uh, the results, the final results that come out of the, the phase one study. But um, you know, plans are underway to start that communication process with the FDA, uh, which will then act as a springboard to uh, start that phase two study. And and who knows? I mean, at, uh, when the phase one data comes out for uh, uh, for MND, it could well be that there's uh, you know the potential to do a a partnership with one of these companies that have been uh, you know. In the rare disease space, right. Well, Michael Thun, well done on on joining this excellent uh, company and the opportunity. Uh, good luck on what co- comes in the next uh, year or so, and uh, we look forward to some uh, progress as you uh, uh, create uh, the next big thing for for uh, patients who've got uh, ALS slash MND. Thanks, Stuart. 